This is Duke University. So I, you know, I, I teach some medical students, and that's where the experience come from. We, we had a brain two years ago. I was just absolutely appalled when I saw the degree of atrophy. I've never seen a brain with so much of it had just been uh, destroyed because of this ongoing process of neural degeneration. Right. So that would have affected that person not only cognitively but physically as well. Absolutely. Right. 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 And the narrowing of the vision and the things that go along. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so so it's usually not that obvious that that was the case where it really was. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ryan. That's cool. Yeah, thanks for your yeah. 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 That's the best. Has Brad been back? Did you look at my head? Two rounds. Maybe you're out. It's hard to find people. I haven't been here. Is this his laptop? Is this his laptop? Okay. Well, that's the best. Yeah, let me grab mine. Oh, here you go. Yeah, it's just like the most important. You have to play around with it. Hi. How are you? You look like you're ready to hold the brand. I've never. You want to do it? Well, it's yeah. super cool. Yeah, why don't you start with this one? Okay. So this is a really remarkable yeah, yeah. Just You get your hand under it, right? pick it up. You can hold uh, yeah, it over yeah. the, uh, yeah, it looks good. the tray here. Okay. So everything about this frame is really beautiful, aesthetically, but more importantly, the health of this frame. Well, this is just based on its dimensions, its fullness, but also the quality of the blood vessels, which is very important for brain health. They're just beautiful, and they're free of any obvious indication of disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you turn the brain over to look at the underside, I'll just point out uh, these are major arteries that supply blood to the brain, and I've never seen a brain where those vessels look so good. So really? I, I wish we all had blood vessels. Uh -huh. that person. Now, why don't you put that down for a moment and compare that to this specimen over here? And uh, this is a person that was from having a serious risk of stroke. So if you if you turn to the underside of the brain you'll see that these blood vessels look very, very different. All of these uh, irregularities in color and in dimension and thickness. This is evidence of atherosclerosis, or inflammation of the blood vessels that can come through bad genetics, but also through lifestyle choices, such as sedentary lifestyle, uh, smoking, alcohol. You say sedentary, though, just like not doing it. That's right. And that damages the brain like it's not. So, sedentary lifestyle is a risk factor for atherosclerosis in the vessels of the heart and also in the brain. So, if you want your vessels to be more like this, regardless of what your genes have given you, aerobic exercise, the single best thing you can do. Yes, absolutely. But you're supposed to be holding it. Yeah. So, why don't you put right over there? Cortex. 
back of the uh, public okay. And then you said that this is the brain of who? Somebody who was Of an individual who was brave and kind enough to donate uh, his brain to education um, and science. Maybe a little bit later. Uh, okay. so somebody was asking, what is that? What is this separate park here? That, that's this here. is the Dura Mater. Okay. This is one of the thankfully uh, protective coatings that we have around our brain. And take a look at it, the inside. It separates the and further protects the two hemispheres. Uh, Dura Mater uh, means um, in English uh, tough mother. So you have a la layer of tough mother protecting your brain. Yes. Um, and somebody was asking if this is a real brain. Yes, this is a real oh, brain. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very much a real brain. Very much indeed a real brain. <laughs> He's like, yeah, come on. Hey, I'm going to hold it over here and take pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is... Half of human brain? Yes, it is, indeed. And Half of a, human brain? This is the left hemisphere. Okay. We have the right hemisphere here. And what you're looking at here, maybe this pops out. Uh -huh. um, this is very light color. Mm -hmm. This is white matter. It's part of the corpus callosum, which is a bundle of axonal fibers that transmits information, signals from the left to the right hemisphere and back and forth. And that's very important. Um, and you can see the, uh, the hind brain. And this is the cerebellum that we mentioned already. Um, and you might also, let me hold both of these up next to each other, both of the hemispheres. You'll notice that they are not identical. It's not just because of the specimen cut, but you'll notice that there are some differences in the folds and the gyri. Gyri and sulci um, refer to the hills and the valleys of the brain. And the reason why we have so many sulci and gyri is so that we can increase the surface area so that we can increase the number of neurons packed into our skull and our brain. But you'll notice that you'll have different hills and valleys. And that information gets transmitted through the nose. Hi, guys! I'm going to take this out. Come on! Lifestyle can monitor our, our, our genetics and their expression in terms of, of health. And so that's something we do have some control over. So, one thing that you can look at is all the. So, is that partly why the vascular network is so much darker? Uh, that's pretty much darker. Most of the vascular is still darker than these vessels. Right? I'm over at the new lines. Are you? No, no. They got a lot of so, this is uh, Brad Barron, the Associate Athletic Director, mm -hmm. uh, good friend of uh, myself and his wife, Susan. So, uh, and I want a picture of them controlling the brain. Brad works, works a lot with supporting the academics for the athletes. So, 
privacy, we've got some neuroscience majors that are also in the That's right. Division 1 athletes. And coordinated lens, building and cameras for the school. That's right. Yeah. Right. So, go ahead, Brad. You just dig in there? Uh, well, not dig, <laughs> but, but gently cradle the brain. So, we, want, we might want to assume that perhaps the lung cancer is related to the smoking, that would be an assumption. But if it were the case, that makes the uh, health of these blood vessels all the more remarkable in this brain. But really, everything about this brain is just beautiful. Uh, aesthetically, but more importantly, anatomically, in terms of the health of the brain, everything about this is just remarkable. Healthy brain, and the fact that it's from someone who is 79 years old is more than impressive. I think that bigger than my brain. Uh, aren't all brains about the same size, though? Uh, no, no. There's, there's remarkable variation in brain size and in the details of the structure. So generally, the male brain is larger than the female brain, and that's true even when you correct for body size. <laughs> Okay. But, but fundamentally, we don't know how to interpret the size of the brain. We know that a brain can be pathologically small or pathologically large. It can be pathologically complex or pathologically simple. But within those limits, there's just the, this enormous variation. And it really is almost uh, bewildering how much variation there is in what we might consider to be neurotypical individuals. And so, so I think the more we learn about the brain, the narrower does our sense of neurotypicality become, and I think that's a mistake. I think we really need to embrace the diversity that our brains present. Uh, the size of the brain, does it have anything to do with the uh, The overall size, absolutely not. That's, that's what got human history into deep trouble, right? You know, but back a few centuries, white European men thought that their brains were larger than any other people group on the planet, and that became a major uh, of justification for enslaving people from the equatorial regions of the world. And um, so that's that's our legacy. You know, we have to embrace that legacy as brain scientists that we were part of that story because of what Stephen Jay Gould, the Harvard anthropologist, called the mismeasure of man. So. Uh, I'm somewhat concerned about this fact, though, because today people will point to certain parts of the brain and say, ah, look, that part's bigger. That must mean that it's better. And I think we still don't know enough about the brain to know how to interpret brain size. Even in our restricted region, I'm pointing to a part that controls the right hand. So you might think that, well, maybe this is bigger in a right hander than a left hander. Or maybe this is bigger here in a violin player whose left hand is doing this amazing thing compared to the right hand, which is amazing, but not quite as amazing. And, and in fact, that's true. So this part of a violin player's brain would be larger than that part. So, so there is some reason to think maybe bigger is better. Maybe brain is sort of like muscle. But I think we have to be just very cautious in how far we go. And that was one of my questions that I didn't want to ask. Uh, in the presentation, where they, where they talked about uh, you know, the, the DNA being yes. and increasing brain right. size, and I, I think it's just really so what? So what? what? What difference does it make that yeah. you can increase in this brain size? Because I, I'd always heard the same thing that you always said, which is fundamentally, we don't you know, it doesn't really make a big difference. Right, so, so what, what's the so what? Yeah, now I think if you look over the broad sweep of evolution and compare, let's say, uh, a primitive mammal to a more advanced mammal, then I think there is a meaning to brain size. Or even if you just limit it to primates or just hominids and look at the hominids that have inhabited the planet, clearly brain size means something. The question is, what does it mean? And what does it mean within a species like 
common? Can we interpret uh, brain size uh, from you know, one person whose brain is 900 grams to someone whose brain is 1,600 grams? Uh, there's almost a two-fold range with the normal people, but we really don't have any science that helps us understand what that means. So one idea is that better brains Maybe they're faster, maybe they're more efficient, and that doesn't necessarily come with having more brain cells. Now, it might have something to do with the richness of the interconnections. So, so that's where we want to know not just how many cells are being made as we build a brain, but what is the richness and the quality of their interconnections. Lynn, I, I told you I want a picture of him holding a brain in his children. Oh, uh, cool. Uh, and you oh. might have met Chitin before he took our good task force. Good. Good. So what I, what I would highlight is the blood vessel skin. Okay, so there's a lot of atherosclerosis in these vessels, a lot of inflammation that puts this person at risk for having a stroke because uh, some of this hardening of these vessels can constrict the flow of blood or possibly some of that material could break off and then flow downstream until it gets stuck somewhere out here around the brain. And interrupting the blood flow, the, the brain has about a minute before its brain cells start becoming dysfunctional if the blood supply is compromised. And what happened to this person? This person died with Parkinson's disease. Uh -huh. Okay. Interestingly, they, they might have had some cardiovascular related issues, but we don't know that. We actually don't know much about the individuals who donate their bodies to Duke. Um, there are some you know privacy issues there that, that we respect. We find out about them as their bodies are being dissected. So sometimes we find some real surprises. But uh, in this individual, we did not expect to see this degree of vascular disease. Now, I know where to cut to look for evidence of Parkinson's disease, but, but we, we wouldn't look at the brain in your hands and say, oh yeah, that's someone with Parkinson's. We'd have to cut right deep down in about there, and then we'd look for the presence of these cells that accumulate a, a black pigment. And if they're if they're missing, then that would confirm that it's a Parkinson's disease. So when they're studying all these football concussions, yes. where right. is, is that a certain part of the brain, or is that like inside? Yeah. Uh, with traumatic brain injury, uh, even mild traumatic brain injury, like what we call concussion, there are typically a diffuse injury. If there is serious injury, then uh, probably there is a more focal, obvious site that has taken the brunt of the impact. This is the brain stem down here. This is the part we worry about the most, because if you have injury here, that could be life-threatening. Put, it, put that injury up here and the patient, the person may never know it. But the same injury down there, for example, Dale Earnhardt, a NASCAR driver who died in the Daytona 500 a few years ago, he had a relatively small injury to his brain stem. And that was enough to kill him. If that happened up here in the cerebral hemispheres, again, depending on where it was, he might not have even known that he had that injury. And is that normally the best protected area? Uh, it sort of the brain to stem? Yeah, it would sort of appear to be the tiny. Well, you know, the brain stem is actually somewhat at risk because it's surrounded by this uh, tough yes. tissue. <laughs> and sometimes that tissue can actually cause problems. This is called the dura mater, which protects the brain, but it forms a tight collar around the brain stem. And if there's some swelling in the brain, the brain stem can get pressed against that collar and that can cause some damage. If there is a lot of brain swelling, then the brain stem can actually get pushed against the base of the skull. And that also is a life threatening problem. I do. But one of the first things you said to me was, um, I'm going to need a table. Yes. Imagine right. a cookie sheet with yeah. a brain on it. And That's I was right. Like, that is my first language. 